Um, greetings, everybody. Um, welcome to today to, to today's webinar. My name is Gitu Milling, a metallurgist at Mintech. I'm going to chair today's um, webinar, uh, which will be presented by Dr. George Blankson Abaka Wood. I will give you guys a brief introduction of Dr. George before I hand over to him to, to, to take us to his presentation. Dr. George is a research associate and process metallurgist at the Future Industries Institute of the University of South Australia. He holds a BSc in mineral, engin mineral engineering uh, from the University um, of Mines and Technology in Ghana. He also holds a PhD in minerals and resources engineering from the University of South Australia. He's also a member of the Australasian Institute of Mining and Metallurgy, as well as a member of the Canadian Institute of Mining, Metallurgy and Petroleum, CIM. Um, he, hold, he has over seven years professional experience as a metallurgist um, or minerals processing engineer, and he has worked with Goldfields Ghana Limited Process Innovation in Ghana and Heathgate Resources, a, ura a uranium mine um, in Adelaide, Australia. Since 2015, he has demonstrated highly specialized skills and expertise in research and innovative metallurgical studies geared towards the recovery of critical minerals such as rare earth elements that occur in, in complex deposits. I will hand over to Dr. George. I know a lot of people who like me have been looking forward to this presentation, so we look forward to you sharing to, with us your story. You can take over, Dr. George. Are you still on mute, Dr. George? Yes, I think I'm on now. Yes, you are. Yeah. Okay, all right. Okay, so um, I'm speaking on the topic, uh, the beneficiation of red minerals from uh, mining tailings as analog of complex low-grade ores. Um, so I'm gonna give a brief uh, background and significance about rare earth elements and uh, provide you with a, a short uh, review on beneficiation methods and discuss the case study for which I'm going to make, uh, give the presentation today, draw some conclusions and recommendations and spell out some benefits of recovering rare earth elements as byproduct of, uh, byproduct of uh, primary commodities. So as uh, most of you will know, rare earth elements actually uh, it's a group of elements that make up the lanternite series. And I've, uh, that has been highlighted on the uh, periodic table there. And this, well, this group of- Sorry to interrupt you, George. Um, I, I'm not sure if you at this stage are wanting to share your presentation as yet, um, but oh. if you, you can't see your presentation, it's not being shared. Okay. All right, all right. Okay. Uh, I guess everyone can see it now. Yes, thank you. We can see it. All right. Sorry about that. I thought it was already than earlier. So anyway, so this group of elements has been uh, steadily growing in importance due to their pivotal role in technological and industrial applications in the 21st century global economy. <clears throat> uh, it's actually expected that most, some of these rare earth elements will be in short supply in the next 
uh, 15 to 25 years. Typically, you know, demium, europium, terbium, dysprosium, and yttrium. Uh, it is important to note that uh, about 66% of the global rare earth demand uh, is accounted for by lanternum and uh, cereal. So there have been quite some striking statements that have been made about the rare earth elements. Uh, Japan in 1992 stated that the Middle East has its oil, but China has the rare earth. And there is a Chinese metaphor that goes by rare earth are the vitamins of a modern economy. And the Japanese actually also refer to this rare earth element as the seed of technology. Um, REEs are also regarded as the engines of electrification because they have uh, application in the manufacture of batteries of uh, hybrid and electric cars. They also uh, find great importance in the manufacture of uh, smartphones and smart TVs. Uh, even have, uh, they have applications as a uh, they are used as catalytic converters in the petroleum industry. It is worth no noting that rare earth elements are a major constituent of many advanced materials, especially in the high tech and green energy sector, where robust performance, durability, and low carbon emissions are so important. Uh, these rare earth elements are also find, found in the uh, manufacturing of uh, wind turbines uh, because they can be used. Uh, they can be used in uh, making a strong permanent magnets, which are impervious to extreme temperatures. Furthermore, rare earth elements uh, have uh, diverse forms of military applications. Uh, it, it is no. It is worth also noting that. Uh, the U.S. next generation military technology has become so dependent on the steady supply of rare earth elements because these elements are, are find massive applications in the manufacture of fighter jets and submarines. As you can see from the figure, you probably will need about four tons of rare earth to manufacture a typical submarine. Some specific applications of these rare earth elements in military equipment include fin actuators, missile guidance and control systems, disk drive motors installed in aircraft and tanks, satellite communications and radar and sonar systems. We have to also note that there are no easy substitutes for rare earth elements in most of the applications. Hence, uh, they are increased global demand. An outlook of the, supply, uh, of the reserves of rare earth uh, suggests that about 38% of the economically demonstrated rare earth reserves have, are found in China, with US you know, having only about 1.2, Australia 2.8, and uh, yeah, Brazil has quite significant amounts in there with about 19%. Uh, China's reduction in uh, rare earth production and export restrictions due to high local demand and other trade issues have highlighted the need for countries such as Australia uh, to develop their RE resources into new economically competitive industry. Uh, recently, China announced a significant drop in rare earth export, uh, especially in September 2020. However, the figures indicate that China is still massively increasing its internal production. So it suggests that uh, there is a lot of RE stockpiling going on in China. Uh, in September 2019, China exported about 3,570 tons of rare earth compared to 2,003 tons in September 2020, which represents a drop in about 44% of its supply. 
Well, as the world's leading producer of RE, coupled with the world's largest, pro uh, having the world's largest proven RE, or any move by China in terms of red production and export is obviously crucial as RE are critical to high tech industry globally. So you'll understand why there is an increasing effort to exploit resources uh, all, uh, all over the world at the moment and rare earth element is gaining a lot of attention now. So RE is generally okay in deposits with other elements, right? And uh, literature has revealed that they are mineralizing about 250 phases with bastnesite, monazite, and xenotime currently being exploited on commercial basis. So I have a, a table showing some example of key rare earth minerals and as highlighted, you realize that bastnesite, monazite, and uh, xenotime have really high concentration of REOs, hence they are the main uh, resources that are being exploited for their rare earth content. Well, and it is also important to note that these resources differ chemically and mineralogically. Thus, it's always required distinct uh, metallurgical development and all specific approach to really design a beneficiation methods to recover these rare earth elements. Conventional, conventional beneficiation methods which are used include magnetic, gravity, electrostatic, and froth flotation. In some ways, uh, the sliming have been introduced, roasting as well, but these are the main uh, beneficiation methods that are used in exploiting REE minerals. So I'm gonna touch few, uh, I'm gonna touch on the uh, separation method that I used in this research. And the first one is magnetic separation, which actually utilizes the differences in the magnetic susceptibility of minerals to you know, concentrate uh, mineral of interest whilst rejecting the gunk. Uh, minerals are grouped into three, uh, three forms based on their magnetic properties, uh, and they include ferromagnetic, paramagnetic, and diamagnetic. With ferromagnetic and paramagnetic minerals, they tend to be attracted towards the point of uh, greater magnetic, magnetic uh, intensity while diamagnetic minerals are actually repelled from uh, the magnetic field. It's the main difference between ferromagnetic minerals and paramagnetic is that ferromagnetic minerals have higher magnetization at lower applied magnetic field intensities and are able to retain remnant magnetism when they are taken away from the magnetizing field. Most valuable rare earth minerals as seen in table one are paramagnetic. Uh, if you cast your mind back to that, you realize that bastnesite, monazite are both paramagnetic minerals. Uh, and also in China, mo most of the rare earth plants mainly use uh, magnetic separation to reject iron oxide minerals prior to rare earth minerals recovery and upgrade. So typically what is done in China is that they apply low intensity separators to reject iron oxide and subsequently use the high intensity magnetic separator to concentrate the rare earth minerals whilst in a silicate and other gang minerals report to the tailings. Uh, gravity separation exploits the differences in the specific gravity of minerals uh, to concentrate uh, uh, heavy minerals of interest whilst rejecting the lighter ones. Conventional methods that are used during gravity separation are Jake spiral classifiers and shaking tables. And these are most appropriate for coarse particles. Where you encounter fine mineral, fine particles, 
they enhanced or advanced gravity separators, such as the Nelson concentrators, Falcon and Melty gravity separators are used. Fraud flotation actually has been the most successful uh, method used in uh, recovering different, different uh, rare earth element minerals. This process actually exploits the differences in the physicochemical properties of minerals to really concentrate uh, your mineral of interest. Mineral particles generally may be described as hydrophilic or hydrophobic due to their interaction with water. Particles that have strong, affi that have, uh, strong affinity for water molecules are described as hydrophilic, whereas those that tend to repel water are hydrophobic. Pulped minerals or ores are scarcely, uh, are scarcely hydrophobic. That means that they are most ores or most minerals are naturally hydrophilic. So it, it, most minerals require chemical or surface treatment to really induce hydrophobicity or hydrophilicity with the use of frotters, collectors, and depressants. So collectors or depressants are actually introduced during flotation with uh, collectors mainly to promote the hydrophobicity of minerals, whilst depressants enhances, uh, depressants enhance the hydrophilicity of uh, minerals. So where you have a mixture of hydrophobic and hydrophilic particles in water, the hydrophobic particles tend to attach to the air bubbles and forming mineralized froth and floats to the surface when air is introduced. The hydrophilic mineral particles remain in the pulp suspension, which then reports as flotation tailings after the mineralized froth are recovered over a specific time. So I have uh, an image there showing the principle of flo uh, flotation. Uh, fatty acids and hydrozamates are, are common collectors that are used during the beneficiation of rare earth element minerals. Other collectors that are used include dodecylamine, nephthenic acid, sodium dodecylsulfate, among others. Typically when, you, typically, when collectors are being used, they form a monolayer of hydrophobic hydrocarbon on the surface, on the surfaces of these rare earth minerals to impart hydrophobic properties to enhance their flotability during separation. The, the depressant used during froth flotation is detected by the gang minerals that are in there. So, depending on what uh, the mineral, the gang minerals that are dominant, uh, you probably may choose chemical depressants or organic depressants. But typically, sodium silicate, uh, sodium lignin sulfonate, and starch have been used in a lot in a lot of. Uh, rare earth flotation uh, processes. So I'm gonna touch uh, on the Australian rare earth story. So data published by Geoscience Australia has actually suggested that about 83% of Australia's total rare earth resources are located in South Australia. However, these resources, these resources um, are also rich in copper, gold, silver, and cobalt, and, and lead. So during the, benef during the processing of these deposits to recover the primary, primary commodities such as the gold, copper, and the lead, uh, most of the rare earth elements, because they are in low, they, because they are low grade, they tend to report to tailings and it has been found that over 160 million tons of rare tailings have been generated uh, in South Australia, where there is currently no cost-effective technology to uh, recover these rare earth resources. So that leads me to uh, my key research question that, can these rare earth minerals in 
these complex low-grade tailings be recovered uh, economically using existing processing methods. So with the existing environmental challenges and concerns for lasting availability of natural resources, these often ignored waste repositories might offer significant opportunity for more sustainable development, or at least could provide added value to existing operations or project uh, or, pro uh, or productions or production. So the main aim of this uh, project was to create knowledge and ascertain the technical feasibility for sustainable RE recovery for mining tailings of complex uh, mineralogy. So specifically, I'm going to look at characterizing these, uh, characterizing a typical uh, mining tailings obtained in South Australia. And I'm gonna discuss with you how try to, how we try to uh, explore and develop magnetic and force flotation methods to recover these red minerals. And also will identify some processing opportunities and challenges uh, with separating these rare earth minerals from the mining tailings. Just for you to note that these tailings that, uh, that I'm gonna talk about was obtained from a copper cobalt uh, mining operation. So a chemical analysis of the tailing suggested that the total REO content was 1.52% and uh, the major gang in there was silica, right? So you have a uh, silicon making uh, about 22%, uh, silicon grade of 22%. Uh, the distribution, mass distribution also suggests that the tailings is generally fine with majority of the particles, about 55% finer than 38 microns. And you note that most of the rare earth, uh, rare earth element along with iron and silica species are concentrated in the minus 38 micron fraction. I did a chem scan analysis also on the tailings and found out that the rare earth minerals in the tailings are mainly bastinocyte and monocyte, but bastinocyte was the major rare earth element mineral, they're making up 1.6%. The total ion oxide in there was 7.5, and silicate minerals, which comprise quartz, muscovite, anite, elite, pyrite, scalonite, and other silicates made up about 68% uh, of the total weight. And we have clay and other oxides making up 22 5% did a liberation analysis and we found out that 19% of the bastinocyte particles were completely free as against 35% of the monocyte but majority of the bastinocyte particles were with form middling composite particles with the gang minerals that's about 59% of the bastinocyte was within the middling fraction whilst 25% of uh, monocytes was also within the middling fraction. So for during the flotation test, sodium molyate was used as a collector and all the pulp, all the pulp, uh, pulps were prepared to 25 weight uh, in a cell volume of one liter. We used an air flow rate of 1.5 liters and, and impeller agitation rate of 900 RPM. Uh, when needed, pH modifiers, hydro, dilute hydrochloric acid and sodium oxide, sodium hydroxide were used and the presence that sodium silicates and starch were used at the, as this presence when required. For all the tests that I'm gonna describe to you, a total flotation duration of 10 minutes was used unless otherwise stated. So the first step was to ascertain the effects of pulp pH on RE recovery. And from the graph, you will see that there is uh, statistically no difference between the yield and the various and the recoveries of the various species uh, in the tailings. Uh, 
So uh, the first thought was that, okay, let's do the sliming, right? Take out as much slimes as possible because you're recovering the same mass as the same uh, rare earth oxide and the silica and iron. So we did the sliming where we removed the minus uh, five fraction of the, of the feed. And this is what we ended up with. We realized that the, there was a significant upgrade in the rare earth oxide. Uh, at pH nine, the grade increased significantly from 0.96 to five. And at pH 11, realized that the grade increased again from 0.96 to 3.64. However, there was a drop in the recovery. At pH 9, rare recovery dropped uh, from 51 to 44% after the sliming and 64 to 50% after the sliming. So you also wanted to you know, ex explore avenues of you know, enhancing the selectivity and RA recovery. So we introduced the depressant. So during, during the introduction of the depressant, you realized that there was a drop in both the recoveries and grade for all the tests conducted. For instance, at pH nine, RE recovery reduced from 44 to 31% with a corresponding decrease in grade from 5.06 to 4.2 when the when the present uh, were introduced into the flotation system. So then decided that okay, we're gonna maintain um, the flotation concentrates produced at pop pH nine after the sliming as the as the um, as the rich flotation concentrate. So we conducted um, a quem scan analysis on it and realized a significant increase in bastinocyte grade. So from the feed 1.6, uh, bastinocyte increased to 5.6 uh, after the sliming and monocyte increased from 0.2 to uh, 0.3. You also realize that the silicate content in the concentrate relative to the feed had also decreased and so as the iron oxide. Now on the magnetic separation. So during the magnetic separation, pulp weight of 15% 15, 15 was prepared and a fluidization flow rate, water flow rate of one liter per minute was maintained. Uh, we used a fine expanded metal matrix during the magnetic separation. So during, during the WIMS processing, the feed is introduced from the top and you have um, the mesh fitted in between the magnetic canister where, where the magnetic particles are trapped during its operations and the non-magnetic particles flow through and are recovered at the base of the wings. So initially we wanted to, as it, we wanted to investigate the effect of feed mass on REE recovery and grade. And the results suggest, suggested, that, um, suggested that the quantity of feed processed has significant effect on, effect on both REE recovery and upgrade. Um, and from the result, we selected uh, a feed mass of 50 gram as most suitable for the for 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 the for processing, because you realize that uh, a recovery of 94 percent was achieved at uh, an RE, total REO grade of 5.17 was also gotten at 50 uh, grams of feed. So that, that feed mass was maintained and we also wanted to investigate the effects of applied magnetic field intensity on REE recovery. From the graph, it is obvious that increasing the applied magnetic field intensity resulted in 
increased RE recovery. However, there was a, a decrease in the red oxide grade. This may be attributed to uh, the recovery of gang particles as a result of the increased magnetic field strength uh, applied. So again, we then decided that it was decided that, okay, uh, 1.74, an applied magnetic field intensity of 1.74 was selected as the optimum uh, field intensity to carry out subsequent magnetic separation tests. Uh, the concentrates generated at uh, field intensity of 1.74 Tesla was subjected to quem scan analysis and as indicated in table 5, realized that um, basnesite in the magnetic concentrate was 7.4% compared to 5.6%, uh, which was obtained during the flotation. But you know, monazite had the same abundance as that which was in the flotation concentrate. And obviously the, the relative abundance of silica in that concentrate was lower than that in the flotation concentrate for obvious reasons. So the next stage was we just wanted to confirm or test uh, a multi-stage separation process where we pass the feed through a float uh, through the flotation system and the flotation concentrate will then be reprocessed by WAMES and the flotation tails will also be processed by the WAMES at uh, 1.74 Tesla applied intensity. So going through all that, uh, of course, we, and we undertook a desliming of the feed prior to, uh, prior to processing the feed through the uh, flotation cell and the wings. A final concentrate of, uh, a final concentrate as saying 6.79% total red oxide was achieved at a recovery of 18%, right? Um, so a comparison of that result with the initial test has been presented in uh, table six. So from the table, you can it can be seen that uh, the highest recovery in terms of red oxide was achieved through the sliming and magnetic separation at 1.74 Tesla, where a recovery of 94% was achieved with a corresponding total rate oxide grade of 5.17. However, the highest upgrade was achieved through the multi-stage uh, slamming flotation and magnetic separation, where an upgrade of 6.79% was achieved, but there was significant loss of rare earth oxide to the tails. So these results actually present us with a, a number of scenarios that could be investigated in subsequent, uh, uh, in subsequent tests. I must uh, emphasize that this uh, investigation is currently ongoing and we and I am actually trying out a number of uh, processing steps, combining, uh, combining, uh, you know, undertaking log cycle flotation test and log cycle magnetic separation to really enhance uh, the recovery and upgrade of red oxide. So based on the result, realize that basnesite, monocyte, basnesite and monocyte were identified as the main red mineral, as the red minerals in the tailings. And the result also suggests that the sliming prior to uh, flotation and magnetic separation was beneficial in achieving significant total red oxide upgrade. And the result also 
indicates that magnetic separation appears to be a better beneficiation methods for, method for recovering uh, the rare earth element from the tailings being studied here. Also, the presence of uninhibited middling composite RU particles, even at such fine sizes, limited the selectivity of the separation method, which actually also contributed to the significant loss of uh, rare earth particles to tailings during the multi-stage uh, processing. Some few recommendations based on the work that has been done so far include uh, potentially introducing regrinding of the, the slime feed to really enhance RE minerals liberation during uh, beneficiation. This will actually promote uh, this will actually promote the selectivity of the various uh, methods that are being uh, investigated. Also, further studies involving the relative impact of elevated temperatures, different agitation rates, mixing collectors and other depressants, high intensity conditions, air flow rates, pulp density and rheology in the presence of the surfactants used in this work should also be carried out. And also, uh, future work should also look at performing log cycle flotation tests to ascertain any chance of improving the REE recovery and upgrade. We also look forward to investigate the use of other matrices such as the stainless wood, the medium or coarse expanded matrix steel balls during a WIMS processing to see how much we can actually improve the, the recovery of REE and upgrade. Uh, recovery and upgrade of RE as seeing that in, uh, when you are when when processing the tailings through a multi-stage uh, multi-stage process you tend to lose some of the rare earth elements to the tails of the of the wings so also explore the avenue of gravity concentration uh, uh, avenue, uh, avenue such as the Nelson concentrator, the shaking table and the Falcon, and even the multi-gravity separators to see how much we can pull using gravity separation methods. So what are the benefits of uh, recovering these rare earth elements from the tailings? It actually presents an economic advantage for projects and operations that are having a lot of REEs reporting to tailing stream compared to uh, other projects which are solely established for RE and primary commodities. Generally, tailings ponds or storage facilities must be monitored and controlled over the mine line due to challenges associated with them, such as uh, pollution. So, Reprocessing these tailings actually eliminates or reduce, reduces ongoing cost of tailing storage and management. It is also important to know that these tailings are already prepared for loading and concentration, and they do not require any form of combination, which actually takes up about 60% of processing costs. Also, there is a positive environmental impact where there is a significant reduction in the tonnage of waste that are being stored or that are being generated over a mine life. With over 50 uh, million tons of rare earth lost to tailings in South Australia, it is clear that such mine waste may be regarded as you know, secondary i.e. or unconventional resources, which could be considered for beneficiation. However, this requires uh, economic assessment and more detailed resource estimation, which is uh, beyond the scope of the current uh, discussion. Furthermore, we can see that there is significant i.e. upgrade and recoveries, which were, which were achieved using these 
comparatively low units, low cost units at limited number of operations. This rendered them easy to introduce in an already existing processing plant to treat uh, such mining tailings. So what's our take home message? So the take home messages is that though the, the mineralogy of the tailings feed used in the present study limited the grade of the final concentrates in some of the processes, the, the methodology is sound for assessing other potential tailings and low grade odds for IEE beneficiation. And also mining tailings in South Australia and some parts of Australia or globally could be considered as secondary or unconventional IE resources, which could actually provide added value to existing operations and production. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. George. I really enjoyed this presentation and I would like to urge the, the attendees to um, continue to put in the questions in the Q&A sections and then I'll read them. And then just as a start, the first question from me, Dr. George, is that 160 million tons is, 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 is that um, total um, tailings from different resources and is it the same you took did you take the samples that you tested from that resource or another one because 160 million is quite a lot it really is yeah yeah so basically this this is uh, an estimated value of the tailings that have been generated in the whole state of south australia okay. so if if you know south australia very well you realize that we have the BHP Olympic Dam here, which is one of the largest mining operations in the world. And uh, some of the tailings that are generated in there contain uh, some rare earth values for which I did my PhD on. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, it it's actually includes uh, tailings that have been generated in the whole of uh, South Australia, not from this particular tales that I worked on. Okay. I have a question from Kevin. Um, he asks, are you looking at various WIMS technologies to see if there are any benefits for REE uh, testing? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this, um, again, I, I will say that it's, it's from uh, parts of the of my PhD studies. And currently it forms um, a significant part of um, some work that I'm currently doing for some companies here in, uh, in South Australia. So yeah, I'm employing WIMS uh, in different forms of applications uh, to really upgrade this, these uh, rare earth elements. The, the only challenge here is that I'm not able to share a lot of the result due to conf confidentiality stuff, right? But the main idea here is that we want to, you know, project and say that it's possible that the WIMS technology could be exploited uh, to, uh, to, to, to recover this rare earth element where you have, you know, silicate gun minerals or iron oxide minerals in the tails, as was in the ore that I worked on during my PhD. Great. I have another question from Nick. Um, he asked, have you performed high level economic analysis to determine whether this is financially viable? What would the next processing steps for um, the REE concentrate be? Yep, uh, with, with regards to the economic analysis, no, not at the moment. We, we've not, under, go, we have not uh, done any analysis to that respect. However, I must uh, state here that um, this is just uh, a feasibility study, right? It's a feasibility study that we are actually undertaking. 
uh, in one of the projects where I am working on, we are at the, the, the point of doing uh, economic analysis on what, uh, on the concentrates that we have generated from the use of these, you know, uh, these simple units to upgrade rare earth element from uh, some complex tails. And the next processing step for, for the RU concentrates will be, um, uh, first of all, we'd want to try and uh, optimize the various methods that we have identified. Right? We want to optimize those methods. From there, we are hoping to you know, generate saleable rare earth concentrate, right? Uh, which, you know, uh, other investors will be uh, interested in buying or probably uh, would actually look at leaching some of the concentrates or applying some hydrometallurgical studies on them, depending on the direction of the research. Uh, thanks for, for, for the detailed response, Dr. George. I've got another question from Garrett, and please forgive me if I misspelled um, your name. And he asked um, um, a question about the average grain size, grain size of the tailings in your study, and mm. to which size would you have to regrind in order to liberate most of the valuable RBD minerals? Yeah, so the... So this, this feed has a, a P50 of, you know, uh, 38 microns, right? And uh, let me just share this quick result. It didn't form part of the, um, the presentation, but it was a follow-up work that I did. Uh, did a rate grind to uh, a P50 of 20 microns. And uh, at that fine size, there was some marginal increase in, you know, rare earth oxide up upgrade. However, any attempt to further grind the particle fi particles finer, you tend to, you know, the, the rare earth recovery and upgrade tends to um, to deteriorate. So, uh, probably a cutoff point of p50 of 20 microns may be good for uh, this, this ore, but the point is that it is, is it economically viable? Is it worth grinding that fine for that marginal upgrade? So then we probably will have to, you know, eliminate regrinding based on that result that was obtained. Um, this may a similar question to what you just answered. James also wanted to know uh, what was the particle size distribution of the material you were testing? Yeah, so um, yeah, the, like I said, it's, it has a P50 of 38 microns, a P50 of 38 microns. And um, yeah, I hope that answers uh, that question. Okay. Um, Let's more details. Uh, not sure if I missed it. What were the losses to the to the slimes when you did the de-sliming? Are oh. losses to the slimes? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 14 percent. 14 percent. Should have mentioned that. Yeah, lost about 14 percent of the RE to the to the slimes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, along um, along with along with 43 percent of the silica and uh along with 43% of iron and 32% silicon. Okay, I don't see any more questions. Just also one more question from me. Uh, so the, the material you presented on, um, it contains silica as the bulk of the gang. What are, do you, do you have any idea of the characteristics of other minerals? Is, sil is silica uh, the main gang mineral in the tailings that 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 um, you have studied or are there variations with high iron, high calcium and such? Oh, uh, there is actually high aluminium rather, but um, and yeah, quartz, specifically quartz and muscovite. 
Scots okay. and Muscovites, yeah. Okay, uh, a question again from Garrett. Um, what would be the content of heavy REEs in the or under investigation? And are there tailings in Australia which are especially rich in HREEs? Uh, yeah, for, I'll take the second part of the question uh, as the firstly. Uh, so the current project that I'm working on ha is rich in HREE, -E. but with this all that I presented on the heavy RE, heavy RE content uh, is significantly low. The most dominant heavy RE in there was yttrium. That is why I captured it in the chemical assays. But generally, most of the tailings there uh, are dominated by light REE. Great. Great. Um, thank you so much, Dr. George. Uh, I don't know if there will be uh, further questions coming in, but um, if anybody still like would still like to, to type in a question, they can continue. But otherwise, I will hand over to Wuse. Uh, thank you very much for organizing this. Do you have uh, a word um, from your side, Wuse? Okay, uh, thanks, Itumeleng, and of course, thanks a million times, uh, George, for that insightful presentation, especially about uh, the happenings in Australia regarding red elements. Uh, on, so just a quick one, George, can you please show your face uh, on your video oh. so that we can see you we missed that one? Oh, okay. Okay, uh, then a quick question from my side. Okay, thanks. In terms of scalability, because you showed we are running at one liter scale, I saw the scale. In terms of scalability, are you set up for larger piloting? And is there support from industry in Australia for such undertakings? Because, of course, I'm looking at it from an EU point of view, where there's lots of support from industry across Europe. And when they undertake such developments, they are usually undertaken so that they can be, they are run at small scale, uh, they are then uh, as you, I think you did mention earlier on that you then optimize and then you'll also look at downstream, downstream processing such as hydrometallurgical processing. And of course then the next step then from such a flow sheet development will be to scale up. And then the goal there will be to eventually industrialize with lots of support from industry. So could you say a few words then rounding up everything else? Uh, yes, yeah. so um, again, uh, there is, a lot of interest in these projects and uh, most industries are really looking into this avenue. They're not only the industries, but even the, the, the government, right? They are investing so much in these critical minerals and especially with this R these REEs. Um, to answer your question straight away, I will just say that Yes, there is a lot of industrial support. And with one of the clients that I'm working with at the moment, look, the results that we've gotten, uh, they are really happy about it. And we are almost at the stage of uh, in, uh, industrializing what we have researched on, right? So yes, I would say that there is a lot of interest in there. Um, when you go around and you meet people at conferences or at meetings, there is a lot of, you know, talk about it. I have met uh, high ranking people in the mining sector here in South Australia who have actually discussed some of their findings from my research and they really are keen to take on uh, these initiatives. So it's not only at the research level, but where where there could be easy implementation, there are resources, funding, and the readiness to take on some of these projects. Okay, thanks, Sir George. And then going downstream, then you did mention the possibility then of hydrometallurgical work then that could be done subsequent to upgrading and all of that. So are you collaborating? Do you have collaborators internally or externally? So that you, at this stage, because now you are still uh, developing your flow sheets, so that you actually develop this in parallel with the guys that will, ut that will utilize this downstream. 
Yeah, um, unfortunately, no, at the moment, because as far as I can tell, uh, I have I've not met, uh, the only, the, the furthest I have seen is uh, extensive geological works that are being done by a University of Adelaide, one of the professors who is really into geology of REE. But when it comes to the processing aspect, and it's all centralized to the institute where I am. And, and yeah, we don't really have collaborations on, you know, the hydrometallurgical aspect of it. Maybe because most of these mining companies want to produce concentrate and just ship them off to uh, other places because, you know, the, the challenges of dealing with REE where you have to do with you know the uranium and the thorium and all those stuff. They probably just want to, you know, get a concentrate and ship them off without you know doing much of hydrometallurgy aspect. So it has actually uh, affected the the interest in in you know other other uh, chemical engineers or mineral processing guys to really look into the hydrometallurgy aspect of it. But recent publications that I have seen suggest that there is some level of shift in paradigm where people are started looking at the hydrometallurgy aspect of it. Where, well, for here too, I'm gonna start some few, but we hope to get people to collaborate with at the moment, but now there is none. Um, there is one one last technical question. I, I hope I can, can I take it, Camila, in the last few minutes. Um, oh, sure. no, yeah, okay. it's from Ishmael. He asks that he he says he sees challenges in regrinding as your silicates yeah. will go will go into the ultra fine size, rendering yeah. depressants ineffectual due to yeah. our frost stiffness. How do you plan to overcome this? Yeah. Um... So that's that is where that is where the flotation aspect of this work has landed us. It's really difficult at this stage trying to you know deal with the fine particle flotation. We trying to at the moment um, use what we call a down comma to try you know enhance the selectivity of you know the flotation separation but it is just you know it is just in the hanging because we are yet to uh, uh, take delivery of the, the 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 equipment so that we can set up and see how best we can overcome this issue of you know uh, silica but until we have that um, we just keep uh, looking around and trying other stuff like, you know, do the magnetic separation, grind final on the max separation and all that. But when, when that comes in, we'll certainly see how far we can go with it. Other than that, currently every attempt has failed to really uh, depress the silica. Thank you very much, Dr. George. Um, thank you for your presentation. We learned a lot. It's always a good day when we talk about rare apps. Um, and we wish you luck with um, with the work that you're going to do um, with, with the work in future. Keep us updated and hope to see you at the rare app conference. Camila, there is one more question. Can you get to Sahil? Camila? Yes, I'm, I'm reading the question. Okay. Uh, the question is, um, is the company currently extracting REEs from phosphogypsum at the Palabora fertilizer plant? <laughs> Do researchers in RSA follow up? Um, and he says many things for the interesting presentation. Uh, I might help a little bit with this. Uh, uh, Garak, are you referring to the... Glenova project.
Yes, they, they are currently doing some work. I know they came to Mintech um, last year for some uh, laboratory test work. So it's still fairly active um, at the moment, although I'm not sure at the degree to where they are currently with the test work, but they're still very much active with the project. Great, thank you very much. Um, hope to see you all in the next webinar. This was a great one. Thank you, Dr. Josh, for sparing time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me.